Hey, it's Nora from Tested.com. We're here at GDC 2014 in San Francisco. Once again, meeting with Oculus, Nate Mitchell, VP of Product at Oculus. You guys have new hardware to announce. We do. Oh my goodness, it's Development Kit 2. Yes. The second piece of hardware that people can pre-order. Pre-order today. Pre-order today. Absolutely. So we saw you guys at CES, you guys are demoing a prototype you called Crystal Code. Yep. And a lot of that hardware is making its way into DK2. Let's give people a refresher of what was in Crystal Cove and how that's transitioned over in the few months since. In Crystal Cove and in the second development kit, we have uh, the, the new key features are really positional tracking low, and low persistence. So positional tracking allows you to move in six degrees of freedom much more naturally. Translation movement forward, lean forward, forward, lean back, you know, tilt around corners, that sort of thing. Low persistence display. It's a low persistence OLED display, so it is. Same resolution as Chris Cove, but higher resolution than the original dev kit. Which is the resolution is... Of, of Chris... Of, uh, of DK2. Kit 2 is 1920 by 1080. 19, it's a 1920 by 1080 yes. five inch display. Roughly. Roughly five inch display. Yep. And you're confirming AMOLED. Yes. With a pentile matrix. Yes. Likely. You guys have talked about this at, at, uh, with the Reddit I guys. I need help, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's stuff from Crystal Cope. Yeah. Now I notice there's no IR LEDs visible right. in the front. Like we had those dots yes. in the CES version. So the IR LEDs are still in there. They're actually embedded in the headset. The camera can still track them through the plastic here. So we've hidden them, it looks a bit more pro, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's a big improvement. So uh, how has DK2 changed from Crystal Cove? I know positional tracking was in mm -hmm. both, it is in this one, mm -hmm. but is the range of movement wider? So for the most part, the, the range of movement is wider, but it's not so much the hardware changes as it is software. So we've really been working on sensor fusion, the tracking, vision tracking, um, our filtering system to really make for a much better experience and to track your movements again, more accurately, more precisely, lower latency in a wider range. So that's something that's pretty exciting about DK2 is that um, um, as it improves, really, we're going to be rolling those changes out constantly to the, the into the SDK and to developers. So developers will see the progress very quickly as we go. So it's something that if, if they pre-order this, developers pre-order this, yes. and they get it, and you guys are aiming to ship in July-ish time frame, yes. uh, they will see improvements up until consumer release. Absolutely. And this, you know, Development Kit 2 really has all of the building blocks that are really necessary for great VR. They're not quite there yet, right? The consumer version is going to be another step forward, but it is a major leap from the original dev kit. And with positional tracking, low persistence, developers can do some pretty creative stuff that they weren't able to do before. Michael Abrash and Valve at the Dev Days, at Valve Dev Days, talked, did a big talk about presence. Yes. And you guys really adopted the idea of presence. You don't think DK2 delivers that level of presence yet? Not the level of presence that Michael Abrash is talking about. So there are still, you know, it's its own shortcomings, right? We know what the threshold looks like for for presence. And, and Michael Abrash talked about it in slides, and it's you know 90 hertz, low persistence, with great positional tracking, and, and all these things. We're not quite there with the second Can development Can we talk yet. about, you said 90 hertz, this is 75, 75 hertz, hertz. Yes, which is exactly. close. We're getting closer. And you think that you know, by the time you know, technology will get to a point where you can get to 90 hertz? We have big plans for the consumer version. We're locking down the spec right now. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, people that are working with the development kit too will be helping us again, just like we did with the original dev kit. We really do believe uh, the consumer version of the Rift will deliver a higher level of both presence and comfort that really, you know, blows people away. So in terms of comfort, it's still this head-mounted the harness. Yeah. Uh, you've consolidated the cables a little bit. As one single cable. One We've single gotten rid of the breakout box, so it's actually just powered over USB and then just HDMI port. And you guys are making your own cameras. We are making our own cameras. It's the same sensor that we used in Crystal Cove. Can you give any details about the sensor? I can't. Okay, but it's going to be a proprietary camera. People can't use their own cameras? Yes. So okay. the camera is designed just like everything else for VR. You know, we've very carefully selected our sensor and tuned the tracking algorithms to be for a particular range and a particular size. So you can't just use your you know, webcam to track the Rift. It just won't work. People who've worn uh, DK1, which you can call DK1 now, yeah. <laughs> um, aside from the experiential differences, yeah. uh, the physical differences, is this lighter, is it heavier? So it's slightly heavier. I think it's about 40 to 50 grams heavier. We wanted to go the opposite direction, but mm -hmm. we slipped a little bit and got a little bit heavier. It doesn't protrude as much as Crystal Cove, because that doesn't. was a prototype, you had a lot of empty space. Exactly. What about the weight distribution? Are you guys looking at putting weight a lot distribution of the weight? Weight distribution is 
A little bit better. I mean, the cable is significantly lighter. It's significantly less um, sort of stressful. And um, overall, one of the main things we want to improve for the consumer version is the ergonomics, right? So aside from just overall experience, software tracking, those things, we do want to get it lighter, smaller, and we can do that. We have prototypes in the office that that already show that that's possible. Now, so. I've also noticed there's a USB port and what looks like yes. some type of analog port here. Yes. What are these for? So it's a development kit. We wanted to have a little fun. We decided we'd add a USB hub to the headset for people to attach accessories. So we're seeing a lot of you know videos online of people doing creative things with the Rift. We wanted to facilitate that a little bit more in the developer. Can you give an example of what type of accessory you might So people have in? strapped leap motions to the front, they've mm -hmm. strapped cameras to the front. Um, with the USB port on the device, they can actually just mount it to the headset and do some really creative things. This port here is actually power for the USB. Got it. So because the Rift is now powered over USB, if you plug in a device that's also powered over USB, that might blow open um, the USB spec, so you potentially need another power supply to power like a very high-res camera or something like that. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, in terms of other accessories, now at CS we talked, uh, we talked about uh, like Sixth Sense has their system. Uh, there's the the, the, the treadmill system, mm -hmm. and those companies have had to adapt to your announcement that. Oculus to be more a city experience. Have you guys had more talks with them or putting them in consideration? Like, how, how is that going to work? So we're always talking to uh, pretty much everyone in the in the industry. There's tons of people, you know, doing VR um, controllers and things like that. We are still targeting a city experience. That okay. probably won't change for consumer V1. We've said before, we want to nail that first before we get you standing up, sort of blindfolded, running around your apartment. Right. Um, so we're going to really focus on seated to begin with, and then see where we go from there. And the demo you guys were showing here, the new demo that you've, tech demo that you've worked with Epic, is crazy because you see your virtual body sitting uh, on a couch. Yeah. And that really made me feel really weird. Like you have this like, out of body experience. <laughs> you could see this controller. It's that, it's that taste of presence, right? Yeah. It's like almost you're in this other space. Yeah, so we developed Couch Nights. It's a tech demo using UE4. We, we worked on it with uh, the team at Epic. They did the majority of the work. Great team there. It's a two player experience. You actually see the other player's avatar moving through space. So mm -hmm. it has a bit of that positional tracking. And then we really want to have fun with sort of juxtaposing like fantasy and reality. So you're right. in this room that looks pretty realistic, but then these two colorful cartoony knights drop onto the table and you kind of duke it out. You can jump on each other's legs and, and leave the table and actually walk behind players. Exactly. Making use of the, the head turning. Exactly. People can pre-order DK2 today but you're telling consumers not to buy it. So it, it's got, that tells me that this consumer version is gonna be another step ahead. Absolutely. Um, how far ahead in terms of researching hardware and working with suppliers do you have to be in terms of finding the right panels and, and the right technologies to put in the consumer version? We're, we're in a great spot for the consumer version. We're locking down the spec right now. Um, we, we have a lot of improvements like you've seen that we wanna make pretty much across the board. And we're going to get there very, very quickly. And you guys will be ready to produce at scale? That's a great question. We'll see. It depends on what the scale, sort of the entrance is from the community. We probably won't start out producing 10 million or 100 million units. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with, you know, some number of units for the consumer version. We'll talk about that more as we get there. And uh, hopefully, you know, consumers are excited as we are about the future of VR. So we're GDC, so we've got to talk about games. You guys sure. aren't announcing any games, but you're talking with developers. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that process like right now? And even outside of games in terms of multimedia experiences. You guys were at Sundance and South by Southwest. Yeah, so we have a ton of developers creating really unique content for the Rift. Um, we announced uh, our publishing initiative. I think we talked about that a bit at GDC or CES with Eve Valkyrie. We are publishing a number of other made for VR experiences that we haven't announced yet. More news on that front pretty soon. Um, there's also a number of developers doing really creative things outside the games industry in film and music and things like that. At Sundance, we showed Chris Milk's um, Sound and Vision experience, which is a Beck concert. It's a 360 video experience where you're actually on stage with Beck. And that, for that, audio is going to be really important. So, so how he, are you thinking about audio and integration with Absolutely. Oculus? So he actually, he recorded that whole demo. Uh, it's all binaural audio. And it's this incredible, you know, you close your eyes and Beck is right here next to you. And you turn your head and he just stays locked right there. And it's just an amazing experience. To give people an idea of what that means, there's two microphones where your ears would be. Yes. So as you turn, as, as music plays around you, you get it's positional. It's as yes. well, exactly. And it sounds exactly like it hits the human ear. Um, so we are definitely researching audio. Audio is 
super critical for great virtual reality, and we definitely want to we want to address that so that users have a great experience on the audio side. It really does fundamentally improve the experience. So, does that feel like something you have to control on your end, or is that something that you would want to be open to, to working with partners on? We're open absolutely to working with partners on everything. Uh, audio is still, the jury's still out on audio. Okay. We've been talking to a lot of great people out there. There's a ton of great audio companies. Um, so it's just a matter of finding what's the right fit for VR and what's the right fit uh, you know, for the Rift. So it's Tuesday morning at GDC. Other announcements maybe haven't been made, but there's a lot of rumors that other people are interested in virtual reality yeah. spaces. Um, if Sony, for example, announces virtual reality and is, is luring developers, how would you work with those developers to get their games on Oculus? Hopefully, working with them closely. Um, I think we're excited about the potential of a Sony announcement. Like you're saying, if more developers are getting involved in VR and they're open to you know, non-exclusive content, we would love for them to bring their experiences to the Rift. Um, especially, again, around made-for-VR content. But at the end of the day, more users in the VR ecosystem, more people playing with VR, whether it's the Sony headset or the Oculus Rift or something else, as long as they're having a great time, they're like, wow, VR you know, finally works, it's here, it's great. That'll really help the, the whole sort of movement and industry together. All right. Thank you so much, Nate, for chatting with us Absolutely. at GDC. Again, DK2 is available for pre-order now, $350, and you guys are hoping to ship in July. Absolutely. Will it be a first come, first serve? Yes. Okay, so if people want it, they'll have to pre-order now. But again, not for consumers. Yes, consumers should wait. Uh, it really will be worth the wait. It's going to be, again, another major step forward. Awesome. Thanks. And I'm Norm from GDC 2014 here with Oculus. Have more stuff on test.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll catch you guys next time. Bye. All right. So candid uh, feedback time. What do we think? Um, it, it's really good. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's it. Uh, no, the, it felt a lot like Crystal Cove. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, this prototype felt a lot more put together. The Crystal Cove Physically. prototype, that, yeah, like, like it was less of a prototype and more of a real thing, which makes mm -hmm. sense since they're putting them on pre-order tomorrow. Um, the outer shell both was not 3D printed anymore, so it felt a lot sturdier, and it's a it's an IR translucent plastic, so it doesn't have all the lights stuck. What on did the you outside. feel about the weight distribution? It's still too heavy. It's in the I mean, front heavy. Yeah, it's it's front heavy. Um, I, I mean. I almost think you might be better by putting a counterweight on the back. I'm sure they're smarter than we are on that stuff. Yeah, it has to be lighter for consumer. But uh, you know, Nate, Nate, and uh, the engineers we talked to all said like they're aware of that. And they're working on it. My thinking final. is if they include audio system in it, the, yeah. the cupping of an audio system might bounce out. I don't like the top strap. I know that the top strap is necessary right now. It, yeah, I'm gonna wear earbuds, earbuds. when I wear that thing. Um, in um, terms of the game. So games they had that new great. Epic game, that new tech demo, which was a two-player game. We didn't really explain it that well. We were both sitting down, yeah. and I could, we weren't spatially in the same place. We were uh, spatially it, opposite where we were in the game, which was super weird, because I, I was looking to the right, and you were actually on my left. But if we were actually had that couch arrangement, uh, then that the feeling of presence was very surreal. Yeah, so I looked down, after I, I played that game for a little bit longer than you did, when I looked down and I moved my foot, I expected to see my foot move after right. maybe two minutes in the game, which is the first time I've gotten that. And um, because in the virtual model of the game had the control of the gamepad, and you were moving your, your hands around and yeah. not seeing that physically represented, uh, that was disorienting. Well, but, um, but I mean, we were playing with 360 pads, so if we were using, say, DualShock 4s that have accelerometers, gyroscopes, yes. and a light, then theoretically, they could have done four degree of freedom movement tracking, mm -hmm. uh, so your arms would have moved in the game, I and mean, your legs still are going to be stationary. So uh, one thing we talked about when we saw it at CES was that AMOLED screen, and being able to see that Pentel matrix. Yeah. Nate confirmed it is an AMOLED Pentel screen. We knew that. You can tell that. You can tell it. They said it on Reddit. Um, if we look at the, the subpixels on that, uh, that diamond arrangement, basically, I, I think s still has very little bit of that screen door in so, terms of the delineation between the pixels. Here's the thing about the screen door with the AMOLED, with the Pentile. I'm actually not sure that Pentile isn't better for them than a traditional square pixel arrangement because the screen door is much less pronounced. You almost see it's almost like hexagon, like a hexagon mm -hmm. grid rather than a square grid. Yes. And it's much less apparent. Um, part of it's that the resolution's greatly increased. But part of it is that, you know, you're, you're, it's, there's no, there's not as many straight edges, so it's harder for your eye to pick up and harder for your brain to pick up. Yeah, and then also uh, the brightness. Yeah, it was really bright. Really bright and, and colorful. Yeah. Um, the optics changed a little bit in terms of the field of view. So I, for people who have only used DK1, they're going to be able to see more. Uh, it's vertically it's, and uh, to holler and a little bit wider. Yeah. Um, the thing that I immediately noticed is that 
it felt, feels like there's this bigger sweet spot going from DK1 to DK2 on the lenses. It could have just been the arrangement, but I had a much easier time finding where my eyes wanted to be to get everything in focus and everything looking great. It's a really tough call because pre-orders are available when you watch this video. Don't pre-order now. Don't pre-order. It's very tempting to, because it is first come, first serve, and I know in July, when people are gonna get gonna their first pre-orders, you're gonna want one, but they could not make it more clear that consumer version is gonna be another step here's, up. Here's the thing to do. If you want one today, get five or six friends and pay 50 or $70 each, share one, because you're not gonna use it, it's not something you're ever, like for, for right now, especially with the demo, demos that are available, you're not gonna play three days in a row. You're gonna play for a couple hours and then you're gonna be totally fine and hand it off to your friend. Even better, get everybody to come over, set up the dev kit, run through a whole bunch of demos, try it out, yes. and then take turns using it at home. We'll be getting one. We're getting one. We're doing yeah, some super chat. Yeah, yeah we'll, um, be, we'll be first in line. We'll be doing dumb stuff. Anyway, we'll, uh, so that's it. Anything, any further thoughts? Well, that's it. Um, there might be a Sony announcement later today. If there is, we'll be talking about that on the podcast. Otherwise, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel and we'll see you guys next time. It was a big jump from Crystal Cove, I thought. See you guys later. Bye.